come to the eighth presentation in this expanded bouquet of Hermetic America, one of the qualities that we're attentive to is that the present moment in the United States is the curl of an enormous tidal wave. It is curling around the globe, around the world, but the epicenter of the earthquake that sent it around the world is in the United States. And we're trying to appreciate and understand that this quality of living on a threshold of destiny is a reoccurring visionary theme in the United States and has achieved over the last 400 years an extraordinary energy so that those familiar with a tsunami know that there are usually a scalar of about 10 waves that make up the tsunami and that it's only later on in the sequence that the really big waves come. I remember in 1964, after the big earthquake in Alaska, there was a Pacific tidal wave and we were on the Sutro Cliffs of San Francisco. And the first couple of waves were large, but we were unimpressed and we thought we had wasted our time. But the seventh wave that came in not only washed over the beach, it washed over the great highway and into Playland at the beach down below. And we were told later that that was a small tsunami it was only about 25 feet high. This tsunami that is global now is a thousand foot high tsunami of spiritual energy, of transform. And to ride that wave an experienced surfer knows you have to ride inside the curl of the wave and not on the top of the wave. If you try to dominate the wave with your bravado and supposed technique, you will be wiped out permanently. So we're trying to appreciate how to ride inside the curl that seems like a tunnel when you're there, but with balance and with endurance, with technique and the practice turned into an athletic prism, one can come ashore safely and we will. We have been looking at the way in which beginning seeds in the United States were nourished in such a way that they became enormous and huge. One of the themes that we took in the presentation last week was the development of American astronomy, of how one of the early colonial figures, David Rittenhouse, had in his uh, younger days, a, an enormous talent to make instruments. And one of the instruments which he specialized in, because he grew up to love astronomy, was to make uh, the first orrery, a mechanism that had the entire movement of the solar system in a single small instrument. He made one for the college at Princeton, which became Princeton University and is there in their library today. 
And he made a second, which is in Philadelphia, at the American Philosophical Society in downtown Philadelphia, founded by Benjamin Franklin. The seal of the University of Pennsylvania has the ori of David Rittenhouse, so that when the University of Pennsylvania puts its stamp on the wax of a document, it stamps it with the eye of a divine beholder looking down upon the world from heavenly, compassionate comprehension and underneath it the ori that shows that man has understood a scalar of all the planets that move, the sun and the moon and the earth itself making a perfect seven plus one making an eight, making an octave of what moves within the context and against the background of the eternal stars. This was made in such a way that it startled people to realize the intricacy of the mechanism. And the American Philosophical Society published about 40 years ago a document characterizing the repair of an instrument that was like an ori but was made in 80 BC. It was made 1,700 years before Rittenhouse's ori. It was made 100 years before Jesus' mission. And it, it is the high tech of ancient Greece that finally has been restored so that it is a workable instrument again. And it took some while in order to do this. If one looks at the time of Franklin and Rittenhouse, the 1700s, the 18th century, it came right on the heels of Sir Isaac Newton's great works, the Principia Mathematica, the great book on optics, and Newton's own telescope was an enormous instrument at the time that Benjamin Franklin was born. That telescope fits inside the center of the great 200-inch Palomar telescope that was made on the heels of George Ellery Hale's lifelong adventure. He was born in 1868, just a couple of years after the Civil War. And the Palomar Telescope was finished in 1948, just a couple of years after World War II. In between the Civil War and World War II, astronomy in the United States became a world history phenomenon. George Elroy Hale is the founder of astrophysics. Jumping astronomy, which had already jumped ahead of astrology, astrophysics is the study of the light of the stars which can be then calibrated and recalibrated, and the spectrum of light can be fractionated, can be given special correlations so that every element in the universe has its own registry within the spectrum of starlight. And it is the ability to understand through the visible light the unseen and visible structure of the universe. The great telescope was sketched in 1939, and it was in a book on the great glass eye of Palomar, Palomar that would not be finished for another 10 years, but because 
Hale had died in 1938 before it was finished. And we talked about last week how Hale grew up in a house whose backyard backed up to the University of Chicago. And that he had a little tiny personal telescope that he used. And he was the first to make a heliospectroscope. And it was the beginning of the science of astrophysics as a young man. He then became quite well known for his ability to make equipment. A similar scientist like this was um, Ernest uh, Rutherford, who was able to make his own scientific equipment quite adequately. Someone who was a counterpoint, who could not make equipment, was the famous J.J. Thompson, the great uh, leader of the Cavendish laborator Laboratory in England. Uh, he was uh, inherently clumsy, and they kept him away from equipment because he would break equipment all the time. But it was George Ellery Hale, then, that jumped telescope making to the great Yerkes Observatory, which was funded to be the observatory for the University of Chicago, put in southern Wisconsin, and is still there today on the shores of Lake Geneva, and then jumped it again by building the Mount Wilson Observatory connected with the early Caltech. Caltech originally was called the Throop Institute and became the California Institute of Technology because the higher-up authorities of the University of California refused to have a technical school that was supposed to outdistance all of the technical departments uh, in the University of California's uh, different locations. So Caltech became an independent place, much like the University of Chicago, much like Johns Hopkins University, specializing in the emphasis of the higher reaches of education. And this then was termed a graduate school. The 100-inch Hooker telescope of Mount Wilson was doubled at Palomar. And when it was initiated in 1948, you can see the opening crowd of hundreds, nearly 1,000 people, seated under the actual immensity of the telescope. And one of the qualities of it is that in order to use the 200 inch, the astronomer must sit in the top of the telescope in the center of the eyepiece, his person, his bevy of equipment becomes the pupil of the eye, the big eye of the telescope. This is an American hermetic expansion to incredible degrees. And now we have the news from uh, Fizorg.com, May 13th, 2008. Microsoft's worldwide telescope blasts off. That the entire planet now can have you as an individual with your computer and your printer and whatever other equipment, you will sit in the eyepiece of a planetary telescope able to look into 13.7 billion light years of the cosmos. And to go with it, uh, Google has announced that they will expand this so that one can now not only look at the entire cosmos from where you sit in your living, but you will be able to run it forwards and backwards so that you will be able to see the cosmos at any time in its development, past or future, as well as present. This is not only a 21st century. This is what I have called a new aeon. It is a new time form. And the United States has a tradition of about 300 years of nourishing this quality, 
of independence and freedom, not so much for an individual, but for a prismatic person who is able to understand how to use this, how to live by this, how to live with this in a community of others, and how to transform a culture into a civilization. One of the most profound early Hermetic American writers was a preacher named Jonathan Edwards, educated at the early Yale. And it is Edwards whose selections of writings are paired with Benjamin Franklin so that the modern student's library uh, selections of the great thinkers edited by Carl Van Doren here, Benjamin Franklin and Jonathan Edwards. And one hardly runs across Edwards in normal learning and education, but 25 volumes of his work have been published by 2008 by Yale University Press. Born in 1703, Edwards becomes a prodigy as a little boy. His first published article he wrote at age 11. It was called On Insects. And he studied the balloon spider, or sometimes called the flying spider, and he wrote a monograph on it. 175 years later, somebody in the 19th century was doing a monograph on the flying spider and ran across the fact that Jonathan Edwards had done a fantastic job almost 200 years before him. Edwards had the ability to have a focused attention, almost like a freeze frame ability, to see instantly and minutely in detail and to remember how then, when you speed up the frame, you get a moving picture and you get then a sense in your mind that this is a phenomenon. Um, the University of California Press in 1963 published a little monograph by Leon Howard, who was a Melville specialist actually, uh, The Mind of Jonathan Edwards because he wrote on the mind as well. He is the first major philosophical theologian in the United States, a Hermetic America. One of the qualities in his writing, preachers forever, priests seemingly forever, talk about sin, and especially in the Christian tradition, original sin. But when Edwards was writing on the doctrine of original sin, listen to a couple of sentences and you get a different quality of penetration and focus and the ability to phrase it so that it can be amplified so that one can microscope and also telescope and understand more dimensions than were there before in mentality. It is a transformed mind that is able to slip into the visionary dimension, a quintessential fifth dimension to time and space. He writes, If there be any who own that God preserves things in being, and yet hold that they would continue in being without any further help from him after once they have existence, I think it is hard to know what they mean. To what purpose can it be to talk of God's preserving things in being when there is no need of his preserving them? or to talk about being dependent on God for continued existence when they would of themselves continue to exist without his help. Nay, though he should wholly withdraw his sustaining power and influence, 
it will follow from what has been observed that God's upholding created substance or causing its existence in each successive moment is altogether equivalent to an immediate production out of nothing at each moment because its existence at this moment is not merely in part from God, but wholly from him, and not in any part or degree from its antecedent existence. For the supposing that its antecedent existence concurs with God in efficiency to produce some part of the effect is attended with all the very same absurdities which have been shown to attend the supposition of its producing it wholly. Therefore, the antecedent existence is nothing as to any proper influence or assistance in the affair, and consequently God produces the effect as much from nothing as if there had been nothing before. This is a forerunner of quantum physics. It is an argued rejection of a mentality that is dependent upon an idea of causality overriding occurrences. This is an insight into the nature that phenomenality is indeed quantified. It is a quanta of energy that has emerged, and in its emergence, it is cinched into a polarity which is measurable materially. But it is not that it occurs and just sticks there, materiality, but that all phenomenality is vibrational. It is an energy frequency, and that that frequency occurs in such a way that it has peaks and troughs, and one can measure the energy of a materia and can convert it back into an energia which is purely dynamic. And the simplest equation for this is E equals mc squared. Edwards began to have problems with his congregation in Northampton, Massachusetts. And the more exacting he became, the more precise he became, writing such things as this uh, Yale University edition, Images or Shadows of Divine Things by Jonathan Edwards, edited by the great Perry Miller, who was the uh, great figure at Harvard for 30 years on American uh, studies. Images as the shadows of divine things that the phenomenality has in its energy frequency an undertone of tunability so that one can calibrate the energy to any degree of specification and thus have an astrophysics thus have a quantum physics. But that the calibration is such that it is quantified in its distinctiveness so that phenomenality is only a part of, is only one half of the actuality. The other part, the other actuality, cannot be measured. It does not occur discreetly, and therefore it becomes an invisible, unnumerable common denominator, which usually then, in ancient wisdom, in a Pythagorean music understanding, the phenomenon is the tone. Its pitch its complexity in relationality of a scalar shows that each tone has undertones that go with the tone. And one can compose so that you not only compose with the tones, 
But if you compose with the tones in the scalar, the undertones will count in the hearing. You can't note it, but it will be there notable. In the aesthetic composition, that is not just in the mind, but is also in one's being. But there will be a third element. Along with the tones and the undertones, there will be an overtone. And that overtone will have a continuous continuity that is not diceable into quanta. It is not like a follow undertone. It is the overtone to the silence that allows for sound, for music, to be phenomenally in the first place. Allows it to be distinct. That overtone is a quality. In ancient wisdom, it was called eternity. Plato says clearly in his last great dialogue, the Timaeus, time is the moving image of eternity. And as long as the image moves, it can be discerned, it can be measured, it can be calibrated. Its resonances can be grouped. Its harmonies can be understood and appreciated, and we can create with that. Because as long as we have the ability to understand the resonant scalars, the octave of the notes, and the way in which there are half notes and quarter notes and undertones, one can now compose music. But a really great composer will have a sense of the overtone of eternity that will be there. Uh, Carl Jung once said, called or not, God will be there. This is a quality, then, of hermetic wisdom that was brought together expressively for the first time in a public way in the Mediterranean West by Pythagoras. Exactly at the same time that was brought together publicly for the first time in India by the historical Buddha. And exactly at the same time that it was brought publicly into notice in China by Lao Tzu and revived in the Iranian Persian world as a hidden meaning in the ancient Gathas of Zarathustra. So that one has a whole range of this. But actually, though about 500 BC, you have this in a public way, the first indications that this was a mysterious quality come from ancient Egypt about 2000 BC. In the most primordial quality of Egyptian civilization before it was dynastic, about 4000 BC, about 2000 years before what we're going to talk about for a moment. In 4000 BC, the great Saharan desert had desiccated fast enough and deep enough to crowd the ancient civilizations of the Sahara either onto little enclaves on the coast, but especially into the Nile River Valley. Before that, the Nile was rather dismissible as a place, but increasingly as the Sahara desiccated, the Nile River Valley became the refuge of many different kinds of North African peoples. And because the Nile zigzags like a fertile lightning down into Central Africa, actually splitting into the White and Blue Nile, going to the highlands of Ethiopia, going all the way down to Lake Victoria, uh, 
the sites of uh, Rwanda, Burundi, uh, Kenya, uh, Tanganyika, Tanzania. The quality of Nile civilization, 2,000 years after that, went through a deep transform when the Nubian contribution to Egyptian dynastic wisdom introduced a deep transform. The initial expression of wisdom had come together about 3000 BC into an expression of hieroglyphics. And for the first time, an oral deep wisdom, Saharan integral of many facets come together in hieroglyphic expression was put into a deeper mode, a transform mode about 2000 BC. This is the origin of the, Tibet, of the Egyptian Book of the Dead. It is in the Egyptian Book of the Dead that one finds the transform of the ancient wisdom in terms of a Central African wisdom. And the name for the figure who presents that transformed teaching, uh, we are familiar with the Greek name for it, agathodaemon, the good spirit. It is the good spirit who is the second Hermes. The first Hermes being Thoth, who creates writing, written language who creates a hieroglyphic, expressive symbology. But it is the second Hermes from Nubia, from Ethiopia, who understands that there is a way to read the eternal overtone and the concomitant, invisible undertones of the hieroglyphics in such a way that one is now able to read in a deeper kaleidoscopic way. And the Egyptian Book of the Dead, about 2000 BC, becomes the first expression in the world of this new capacity to understand, to teach, to share. But the teaching and the sharing was limited to a royal level. The easiest colloquial way to say it is, uh, the king must know. It is not incumbent on everyone else to know, but the king must know. And so wisdom was always in the hands of the permanent tutor to the pharaoh, to the king, to the queen, not simply that they were educated as children, but that they continuously now are educated to keep and maintain the wisdom which must be recognized by them fresh every single day. So that the phrase in the new second Hermes was that the that God is the Lord of history, and that history is made day by day. That each day's sun rising, each day that Ra rises, is a new day, is a quanta of phenomenality that cannot be sloughed over, otherwise it will not occur. Or it will occur in a distorted way, and one will interrupt the harmony. One will have a distorted note in the scale. And even if you compose right, you will compose with a distorted melody. It's like a keyboard that is missing a letter. And it will constantly show up in a composition that that letter is missing. And if you keep missing letters, eventually you will get, with the right typing, a garbled manuscript. This is the chaos that comes to the world 
when the continuity of wisdom is not observed day by day. And this quality of observance is that the day itself has its own resonances, the hours, and that complementing the phenomenality of the day and its hours is the undertone of the hours of the night, the 12 hours of the day and the 12 hours of the night as an undertone. And so ancient wisdom was always in this complete cycle and that the complete cycle had an ecology of an eternity that did not shelter it so much but gave it the seal of reality. And so when we come to understanding the ancient hermetic tradition, we come to understand that 2,000 years after the Egyptian Book of the Dead is the time of Jesus. And at that time, the magisterial quality was not to write so much in a hieroglyphic symbol expression. Even one with the undertones and the overtone continuity, not to write in symbols, but to write in terms of life, in terms of lives. So the emphasis in the Hermetic Jesus was in writing in terms of lives, in terms of the days of those lives, in terms of the generations of those lives, and to build up a harmonic of actuality that more and more is able to find freedom in the phenomenality correlated by the undertones in the comprehensiveness, in the encompassingness of eternity. One of the qualities that one finds in Jonathan Edwards right away at the beginning is the sense that he writes this of the Christian pilgrim. Why is the Christian's life a journey or a pilgrimage? He says, we must be taken away forever from all these things, and it is uncertain when. It may be soon after we have put into the possession of them. And then where will be all our worldly employments and enjoyments when we are laid in the silent grave? So man lieth down and riseth not again till the heavens be no more. The future world was designed to be our settled and everlasting abode. There it was intended that we should be fixed, and there alone is lasting habitation and a lasting inheritance. The present state is short and transitory, but our state in the other world is everlasting. And as we are there at first, so we must be without change. Our state in the future world, therefore, being eternal, is of so much greater importance than our state here that all our concerns in this world should be wholly subordinated to it. Edwards was drummed out of his church. He was locked out, like the Reverend Shannon in Tennessee Williams' Night of the Iguana. He was put on the lowest rung of teaching. He was put in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, teaching Indians how to become Christians. But his writings penetrated through to such an extent that there was a clamor to bring Edwards out of anonymity and exile. And he was appointed to be the new president of Princeton University. When he got to Princeton, there was a, an attack of smallpox. So he received a vaccination an early inoculation, and five weeks later he died of smallpox. It was the vaccination that was defective. That vaccination technique was founded by Cotton Mather in Boston, Massachusetts, one of the most uh, torrential of all the fist-shaking, finger-pointing Puritans. <laughs> 
Let's take a break and we'll come back to this. Let's come back to the present moment. As of today, in the American presidential campaigns, both parties are already haunted by ministries that have apocalyptic image, message, broadcasts. This is an enduring sub-theme throughout all of the history of the United States and was there before the United States, was there in the colonial, even before the colonial, it was there where communities in the Americas were called plantations. They were communities of people that were put in a place. They were planted in a place and expected then to flourish in that place according to their plans. The difficulty with the New World is that it was inhospitable to that kind of human movement, not only because of its vast size, the Americas, North and South America, are huge as a land mass, but for the moment in North America, one of the difficulties was that the indigenous civilizations were not centered. When the conquistadors in Mexico wanted to take over, they did a decapitation and the entire country fell. When Cortes marched into Puebla and gained the insight of uh, Marina, who cued him in on the power structure, Cortes took out the top people and Puebla fell and made a forced march with horses that they had never seen, with armor that they had never seen, with guns that they had never seen, and forced his way into the Tenochtitlan region and simply took out the leadership of the Aztecs and Mexico fell. Pizarro did the same thing with the Incas in Peru. But in North America, the tribes were spread out in the landscape in such a way that there was no convenient place to decapitate them, to innervate their ability to maintain themselves. And while there was an Indian metropolis in Cahokia, all the way over across from St. Louis, where St. Louis is now on the Mississippi, it was unknown to the early plantations, to the early colonies. What happened in New England was that in order to maintain the purity of their religious plantation, the strictness of the discipline of their plan, they considered that the way to deal with native peoples was to corral them and retrain them into Christianity and that Indian schools then were a missionary holding of them long enough in a pen until they would be tame, no longer wild. 
no longer savage, savage, no longer at home in what was a wilderness, but tied to the strings that had been applied to them. But it, like a self-fulfilling prophecy, the fear, the apocalyptic fear of the primordiality of the Indian people resulted in 1675, 74, 75, seven, early 1676 in what was called in New England King Philip's War. King Philip was an educated Indian who marshaled many tribes to bring, pool their warriors. And almost a score of towns were completely burnt out. Men, women, and children killed and came within 20 miles of Boston. All of this was predicted and expected by the father of Cotton Mather, whose name was Increase Mather. He's a famous minister in Boston, whose own father, Richard Mather, in England, was relieved of his ministry because he developed a special style of getting rid of the accoutrements of the habits of the Anglican Church and began speaking in his own evangelical insight. <coughs> and so fled to Massachusetts, fled to Boston. Increase Mather became a very important minister and his son Cotton Mather became the most famous of all of the pre-Hermetic American ministers. This Pulitzer Prize winning biography by Kenneth Silverman, The Life and Times of Cotton Mather, talks about how the young Cotton Mather, named Cotton because his maternal grandfather was one of the most famous Puritans, uh, John Cotton. There's a beautiful study, the only one ever done, the career of John Cotton, who was born in 1584 in England, lived until 1632, Puritanism and the American experience. And a great deal of the prejudice against Puritans in later American history was because of figures like John Cotton, Increase Mather, Cotton Mather, of this quality of intolerance, of a forceful, aggressive, authoritarian insistence that you have no place. If you are in this world, this is a highly suspect world and you're successful in this world because your worldliness is a part of the deficiency in you, of the fracture in you, and we are the pure people. And it is our discipline, it is our authority eventually that will take hold. And one recognizes the taproot of evangelical qualities that are in the forefront in 2008 in the presidential campaigns, in the congressional campaigns. That somehow Hitler was a godsend to force the Jewish people back to Israel. That God damn America because it has this prophetic curse that should be leveled against it for what it has done. And this is a theme that goes back at least 400 years. Increase Mather 
began having visions about King Philip's war months and months and months before it happened. And when it happened, Cotton Mather was at Harvard. Harvard had decayed so much, the buildings were in disrepair, it had three students. Finally, they chose a minister from Boston to be the head of Harvard and young Cotton Mather, who had a speech defect, a lisp, was being made fun of by the other two students and one of the instructors and wanted to leave. He had already, the year before in his freshman year, left to study at home under his father, wanted to leave in his sophomore year. The demoralized atmosphere at the college during Cotton's sophomore year was deepened by a violent event, which his father claimed to have foreseen. Early in 1674, Increase felt persistent intimations that God would strike New England by sword. Believing that when God intended heavy judgments, he often forewarned some servant. He pre preached two sermons on Ezekiel 7.7. 7. What is peculiar here is the twist, the pretzel twist that an evangelical Christianity goes back to an Old Testament prophetic warning ethos and does not go into the deeper New Testament qualities, but its phenomenality becomes transposed to a phenomenality that is uh, apparent in a certain prophetic tradition in the Old Testament, one of the most uh, enlightening uh, studies of this came out in, uh, let's see, 1987. Uh, Teresa Toulouse, The Art of Prophesying, New England Sermons and the Shaping of Belief. And uh, the cover of it shows the four different kinds of clerical collars. One of the things that came out of this was that there was an increased sensitivity of increased Mather that King William's War happened, and then there was an even deeper feeling, not for the outlying towns of Massachusetts, for, but for Boston itself. The war was hardly ended when Cotton, now nearly 14, understood himself to have witnessed the accomplishment of another of his father's prophecies. Increase had become strongly possessed with fears that Boston would be punished by a judgment of fire. On November 19, 1676, he again preached his congregation a warning sermon. But he found them unmoved. When he went home, he paced his study weeping, saying, O oh Lord God, I have told this people in thy name thou, that thou art about to cut off dwellings, but they will not believe me. Maria, his wife, did not trust his prophetic sense either. He feared their house would burn, and he urged her to move from it with him and the children. Unawed, unpersuaded, she considered his forebodings only a fantasy in my head. Increase frequently suffered from insomnia, but the fact that he was awake at 5 o'clock in the morning on November 27th, the following week, he attributed to Providence, God and I believe his angels, these are avenging angels, did so influence that I could not sleep that morning. He wrote, smelling something, he rose and looked out the window. Then some began to cry, fire. Cotton Mather saw his family's house burned down in a conflagration that destroyed his father's meeting house and threatened to consume Boston 
If there hadn't been a heavy rainstorm later that evening, it would have been much worse. There were hundreds of buildings in Boston burnt to the ground, and this whole tradition of the fire and brimstone warning sermon from those who were appointed to announce the divine threat came into play in such a way that an enormous change needed to take place. Collected together some of the great chapters by Perry Miller in one of his last books before he died, he died in 1963, uh, Errant into the Wilderness, published by Harvard University Press in 1956. Chapter 6 is Jonathan Edwards and the Great Awakening. The social historian, if he keeps strictly within the limits of his commitment, has difficulty in dealing with the Great Awakening of 1740. On the surface, it seems an inexplicable outburst of neurotic energies, which in most, if not all, of the colonies had not been bottled up, which assuredly needed no spectacular vent. By the time the hysteria died down in the middle of the decade, it does not appear to have accomplished much in the history of America other than producing acrimonious divisions within the churches generating separatists. But he writes, there was a certain satisfaction in standing beside the greatest American leader of the awakening, who was Jonathan Edwards, and trying to make out what he was doing, what, him, what he himself conceived that he had wrought, partly because in 1750 he became the victim of whatever it was he had done. But there is a huge change. Miller, who is the first his, historian, American historian of ideas to point out, in the 17, early 1750s, all of a sudden there is a different tone in what was to become the United States. Why was there a different tone? And the considered understanding was that the publication in 1731 in England of Benjamin Franklin's experiments in electricity shocked the world. The author of this uh, reprint, uh, this is published by Harvard 1941. Uh, the author I.B. Cohen is the founder of the History of Science programs. He was the first head of the first History of Science program at Harvard. And this was one of his uh, first really great publications. He lived for the next uh, many decades and uh, became one of the uh, greatest figures in the world of understanding that there is a history of science. And that history then is quite a different dynamic from what had been assumed about it. And this was brought out as a concomitant because in the 1930s and 40s into the 1950s, in those three decades, there was an increasing understanding that there is such a thing as the history of ideas and that the history of science is a part of the history of ideas and that one must have a new vision of what history actually is in its dynamic occurrence. And one of the touchstones of that went all the way back to the beginnings of the first great history, that of Thucydides, the history of the Peloponnesian War, Thucydides, a contemporary of Plato. In my education, the learning civilization, we begin history with Thucydides who says 2,400 years ago, 
the reason I write this is that knowing what I know now about myself, about my fellow men, about these events, about the deep pattern of these events, they will all reoccur again. They will reoccur as long as there is not a transform of man. And they will reoccur in um, cycles. In the 30s, 40s, and 50s, it was understood that the transforms had been all partial for individuals, for communities, but that by and large, the world itself had not transformed. The United States itself had not transformed. And so it was a patsy for the reoccurring cycle of issues that would come back again and again, and the fire and brimstone ministering on an evangelical Old Testament model of Isaiah-like warnings, of the almost ecstatic discovery that the apocalyptic warnings had come true that the world had uh, indeed been punished, that mankind had been uh, reprimanded with justifiable death. Franklin's experiments with electricity were remarkable because they showed, and you can buy little toys now, like the Benjamin Franklin action figure for little kids with his kite, with the key to his house linked to the kite. And what happened was that Franklin sat at his desk where he did his writing, where he did his thinking. And the key to his house was linked to the world's first batteries, which he made, a whole matrix series of Leyden jars interconnected in such a way that they were able to store lightning, store electrical energy. And for the first time in the world, a man sitting at his desk, like we talked about before the break, the astronomer sitting in the eye of, at the time, the largest telescope in the world, and now anyone can sit with their computer at the Microsoft telescope of the entire species and understand that the primordial forces of energy of nature are tappable for creative use. That you can literally electrify the entire nature of man, the nature of the world, the nature of society, so that it does not any longer repeat blindly the patterns that on an expansion of a nuclear world will mean universal death. It won't take a long time. It will take about 30 minutes. It is this quality that Hermetic America is interesting to us because for the first time with Franklin's experiments in electricity, this is uh, the frontispiece is an allegorical print uh, designed by Fragonard. In one hand, Franklin brings the power of nature down into man's creative use, and the other, in his writings, he undercuts the tyrannies of the old world that they no longer will have a purchase, they will no longer, no longer have a place to be, and that the beacon for this will be a new country, not 13 colonies knit together, but a new pattern which will be the 13 states arranged 
in that kind of primordial way, the original way was uh, the circle of stars. And as we talked about two weeks ago, that circle of the 13 stars goes back before the prophetic tradition in the Old Testament. It goes back to the first Passover. It goes back to the very fundamental basis of the new world, of the new promised land, and transposes before there was this prophetic cursing of apocalyptic doom, there was a thankfulness of a new land with a new unity. And the origins of Passover are there with Joshua, who brought across the Jordan River the Ark of the Covenant. That that Ark of the Covenant went ahead of the people, ahead of all of the armed men ahead of the women and children to cross, and that the Jordan River, like the Red Sea, was parted. With the Jordan, because it was a river, the flow of the Jordan was stopped. And Joshua had the Ark of the Covenant on dry riverbed held there so that the people could cross over into the Holy Land on dry land. One went over Jordan with a replay of 40 years before of the Red Sea parting. And just as when the Red Sea had finished its parting and the Exodus had managed to come all the way across, when the sea came back into play again, there was a chorus between the men and the women on the banks of the salvation side. The women's chorus was led by Miriam, who was the sister of Moses, and the men's chorus was led by Moses. And that particular chorus of thanksgiving was brought back into play after Joshua had all of the people brought across the Jordan, 12 stones were taken from the bed of the Jordan and carried with the people to a mound just outside northeast of Jericho. It's called Gilgal. And they were arranged in a circle on the top of Gilgal. And that's where the first Passover was held to celebrate that we have come across safely to a new promised land, to a new world, to a new dimension of life. In ancient Alexandria, for those who have followed my series on Jesus in Alexandria and Mary Magdalene, the Therapeutae community, the healers, the first Christians, before there was a Christian church, there was something called the way of Jesus. A whole generation before there was any kind of a church structure, a hierarchy. And it's recounted in Philo's On the Contemplative Life. And he says that every Sabbath there would be a general assembly of the men and women to celebrate together, but that on the seventh Sabbath, every double, yeah, seven times seven, there was a special Sabbath of the Sabbaths where they would come together, not just in a general assembly to be together, but they would come together in a banquet. And that at the conclusion of that banquet, which was on the evening of the 49th day, the 50th day, would be celebrated at dawn with two choirs, the men and the women. And they would sing the hymns of the Song of Miriam, of the Song of Moses, to greet the rising sun that this was a new day in a new 
aeon, a new time form, a new quality. And it was the antiphonal choiring of the men and women that would then be blended in such a way that later on in the development of music in the 17th century, one came across a transform of the old Gregorian chant into the madrigal. That there was a way to have the weaving of choirs together so that the madrigal or the musical motet version of it was able to present a new quality of music that had only been heard esoterically by small communities before, but these were now performed publicly. And it is the development of the madrigal and the motet in the 17th century, in the 1600s, that leads directly into a whole new world of music. Classical music from that period on makes all of the music in the world before that seem almost repetitive, almost diminutive. And within a single century, you have the developments of Bach and uh, Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, etc. This quality of maturation happened exactly at the time that Hermetic America was being developed. So that instead of the wilderness being fearful, it became a place to explore. Instead of Indians in their primordiality being fearsome carriers of an apocalyptic um, savagery, they became not only friends, but mentors and guides. And by the end of the 1700s, you had someone like a James Fenimore Cooper writing about white Indians who were at home in what was the great forest. They were at home. They were members of Indian spirit families. And the primordiality of primordial America through the Indians, of primordial Africa, not through slaves, but through special persons who had come as a blessing for the penetration of a new kaleidoscopic history. And added to that was the beginnings of the awareness that there is a whole Oriental wisdom, not just of the Middle East, but of India and of China, and the great figure who really comes to exemplify, finally, the understanding and the penetration that all of these primordialities gave a kaleidoscope to a particular American visionary quality of person was uh, Thoreau, Henry David Thoreau. And it is uh, Thoreau who exemplifies, by and large, the achievement of the first great blossoming of someone who had no particular ties to Europe, whose ties were to primordiality itself. And uh, the Thoreau home was uh, one, uh, his sisters, uh, especially Sophia Thoreau, were some of the leaders for the underground um, passage of slaves trying to flee from the South from the coming of the Civil War, of the appreciation of Indian life. It's the first time that you begin to find little crocheted um, sayings, never criticize a man unless you've walked a mile in his moccasins. And out of this came the first development of the appreciation. A box of Asian classics was sent by uh, Ch Thomas Chomley to Thoreau. And it's the first time 
that any American was able to read books like the Bhagavad Gita and to appreciate what an enormous treasure there was in the world that had never been tapped and that Europe was just a small part, was just a wedge of an enormous planetary heritage. The development of that was in the 1870s, the beginning of an understanding that there needs to be a public transformation of learning on a scale which uh, would uh, change the whole nature of the population. And the learning finally came to fruition in what were called the Chautauquas. Chautauqua, New York, and the upper state New York was the first place that it happened. And the Chautauquas were the rock concerts of their day, but they were rock concerts of learning. And lecturers and presenters of all kinds were invited to participate together in days-long festivals of learning and understanding with music and with uh, slides, uh, um, picture shows, the um, qualities were of families and of advertising now. There are keys to success which one can learn. There are uh, ways in which you can rejuvenate yourself. That the whole tone of the United States in this period was not one just of a reconstruction industrially from the Civil War, but a massive re-transformation of the American population. And the key to it was the move to the West to open up the perimeters that had been given, that it is not just these colonies or these states or these rivers and not even just the Pacific coast, but that the West was also a broadening to the entire planet. And of course, the great figure in that, the great visionary, that the oceans of the world are a part of the American dimension was Herman Melville. In Moby Dick, the second mate, Stubb, says to Ishmael at one point, well, man, Bedford, Massachusetts is not a small place. We own the oceans of the world. We are free to go. We are free to navigate anywhere on the globe. And we hunt the biggest fish of all, the whales. No other country in the world, no other city in the world has ever done this. Not Athens, not London, but New Bedford, Massachusetts. This is a quality in the Americans that finally comes into play, and we'll come back next week to the Concord School of Philosophy. This is the genius and character of Emerson. He had died a few years before, and they had a special volume put out. This is uh, Julian Hawthorne, the son of Nathaniel Hawthorne, who lived in Concord, along with Thoreau and Emerson and uh, Alcott and uh, many others. It is not with us as with other peoples. Our position seems vague because not primarily related to the senses. I know where England or Italy is and recognize an Englishman or an Italian, but Americans are not to the same extent limited by geographical boundaries. America did not originate as did European nations. They were, born, they were born after the flesh, but we were born after the spirit. More next week. Thank you.